Okay, we're on record now, 12.02 p.m. on De uh, December 17th. Wednesday is the regular meeting of the Public Safety Committee. I'm um, Paul Holcomb, the chair, and I'm joined by at least two of the three colleagues on there. Pretty Hall. Okay. And if you don't mind, uh, just so we have it on record, we have representatives from the Public Safety Departments that give normal reports there. So if you just want to go around the table and introduce yourself on the record. Mark Mew here from the APD. Uh, Steve Ashman from the Department of Health and Human Services on behalf of Melinda Freeman. And Rob Fitz with the Office of Emergency Management. Thank you very much. And we'll hopefully we can uh, plug in fire department if they get here. There's a few issues that uh, that are on the agenda under new business. And uh, I guess to start with, first of all, before I forget, and I'll probably hope to say a reminder uh, from myself to all of you that are in attendance, Merry Christmas, Happy Holiday Season to all of you. I hope that if you're traveling, do safe travels, you're staying at home, have fun with your family and friends. And, uh, okay, with that, is there anything for all of you? No. Okay. We're going to start with the uh, police department. Uh, I know we have uh, on here listed Chief the Academy. We passed the budget. Obviously, there was a little hiccup on the current budget where we were able to get some fund balance money to help the true up the budget. So. I appreciate that. Uh, how about how are we looking on the Academy that's ongoing? Have we lost anybody? Or? We've lost some in both academies. We have two academies right now working their way through Academy 14-1 is in FTOs uh, there are 18 left in 14-1 uh, I think we may lose one of those um, how many started Mark you know in the FTO? <clears throat> I think that one started about You know, I got to go back and look. I, I ran all these numbers here a minute ago, and I, and I walked away and I thought, I bet you they're going to ask me how many of that one started. <laughs> <laughs> and I, we've run four of them back to back, and frankly, I don't remember. But it probably was like in the 23, 24 area. It's, right yeah, which one I recall. Yeah, I, I know we didn't get 28. I know we didn't fill it up. But I think it was a, a little bit above 20, if memory serves me correctly. Okay. We... Um, so anyway, uh, that one is 18 left standing. It might turn into 17. Um, and uh, it should they should be cut loose on the street in mid-January. They don't ha all happen on the same day, but they're, they're in their, fourth, their last phase of FTOs. 14-2 um, is in the academy class. They're not, uh, you know, they're still in classroom. There's 23 of them remaining. And uh, they graduate from the academy into field training on March 24th. And then we'll have another academy starting in May, and then another one hopefully in next October. October? So, yeah. And I, I'm comfortable that this 2015 budget is gonna support that. Um, now this year we've had uh, attrition of 22 as of today. Normally we have 20 for the year, so we're a little bit above, but only by a couple. That 22 is probably going to turn to 23 because of the, the one leaving. <laughs> so, in other words, we're ahead of the game by about 17 positions. We've gained 17 net. Ms. Great Jackson. Thank you, Mr. This Chairman. Year. Yeah, no, I just wanted to talk about um, the 2015 two academies. When everybody knows that they're being funded through attrition, and, and you feel comfortable with that? That's going to be the case. Because um, that's how they're being funded through attrition. Yes. Um, unlike last year, see, as I was explaining last night, we had a vacancy factor programmed in, so we had all these PCMs, but they weren't all funded. Right. This year, I think they're all funded, but something like four. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, making a vacancy factor four is like easy. You know, that's. You can't even try. If you could hire cops one at a time rather than batch hire them, you're still going to have the equivalent of four FTEs worth of salary. A little bit here, a little bit there. You know, right. somebody leaves and you hire them a month later. There's a month's salary there. When you have 370 people by the end of the year, you're going to have four FTEs worth of salary without even trying. So I'm not concerned. It's almost like no vacancy factor. So if I can follow up, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So what's the cost of the academy? Roughly, the cost of an academy. 
Just rough. Are and you talking about the, the labor cost or the, the reason, hard cost? Well, here's, here's why I'm you know, talking about this and making it clear to everybody, okay? Because the mayor's budget, okay, uh, provided for two academies in 2015. But the way they're being funded is through attrition. So my, my point is, we're going to be okay with that theory? Because that's how they're being funded, through attrition. Correct. Yeah, yeah they are. Okay. I mean, in other words, there's not a plan to grow the police department past its authorized strength, which is right now about 372. Um, but we're getting close to filling up all those 372, which will get us back to where we were. We were 374 in July of 2010. And the only reason we're not at three, our authorized position is down a little bit is because I converted a couple of those sworn positions to other non-sworn positions because we weren't hiring fast enough and I could convert them and, and we could hire some non-sworn and get some other work done that way. So that's on me, the fact that we're to 372. But the November one, uh, this is a little bit apples and oranges. I didn't get a chance to make this apples to apples, but our latest, uh, we had our November staffing report come in. Like I say, we've probably lost two or three people since that report. But in November, we were at 371 on paper. That's only one position shy on paper of being full. That was 96.9% full on the sworn side. Now, they're all on paper. They're all in training. They're not holding out an area in the street. So you're, you're burning your budget on them, but they're not, uh, sure. they're not sure. providing, providing service to the, to the public yet. By the time every, all these, the 18 and the 23 we just talked about in 14.1 and 14.2 get cut loose and get on the street, we'll have, more people will have retired and we're going to be back to, you know, 92 or 93% staffing and by the time we get to May it will be 91% staffing and then we'll hire another academy we'll be back up to 100% but they're going to be on paper so you're we're in the the up and down in the, the 90s right now and the idea is to get more of those people through their training and so that you if we're 95% staffed and they're all cut loose we're in good shape if we're 95% staffed and 30 of them are, or 30 or 40 of them are in academy then it feels understaffed. Okay, and just if I follow up, yes, one, one more comment. Okay, just um, in the event, okay, that, for example, the, the academy in October, October comes around and we don't have a vacancy back or attrition, if you will, that we anticipated. In the event that something like that happens, just please let us know ahead of time so we know what we have to do in terms of funding, okay? If we get to a place where we, would like to hold a fall academy, and we've only got 10 vacant PCMs in the budget, we have two choices. One is to only hold a half academy, a 10 person academy and fill it up. The other thing which we sometimes do, and we did it this year, is we double fill some positions, hire some positions we don't really have yet, hedging our bet on year of retirement, and it all catches up in January or February. And you can do that without growing your number permanently. You, you artificially grow up for a short period of time because you know your year-end attrition, people like to retire in December, and you end up, it's a bit of a guessing game, but we do it. I think we did it this last October um, that way. Okay. And I think, by the memory certainly correct, uh, CFO found us a little extra money to allow that to occur. For instance, we, I think we funded the two grant positions you guys approved last night by double filling a couple positions in advance. And we knew we got the grant, but it wasn't effective until January 1. So, so. And I swear, this is my last no, comment. Okay. I promise. And my only point is this, okay, I just, we have to have those two academies next year. And I just want to make sure that um, funding is not going to be an issue somewhere along the line. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, Chief, I'm just doing quick math, and I'm not a mathematician or a statistician or anything, but uh, with the hopeful release of the 14-2 Academy that are in, uh, that will be released, be in FTO March 24th, uh, shooting forward three and a half months, we're talking 
probably July, and that's what the earlier somebody getting cut loose from that one. Is that, is that about right? From which one? The 14-2 Academy, the 23 they're in currently now. You said FTO March 24th. Okay, so, so they started. Uh, I see it being March. Yeah, mid July. Okay. July 1 to mid July. So if we keep comes. everybody and your attrition today is 23, and that's 23, you're in that sum of zero right now. So between now and then, you're saying your attrition may, may make up the difference so that we can have an academy that's going to take, hopefully, answer those attrition, that attrition going forward. That what I, I think I just I don't want to beat it up too much. Well, what I'm trying to say um, in general terms is you're normally you have 20 people leave a year in a normal year. Um, and if you let's say you if you have a normal academy class, it's 28. So let's say you hire 30 because you know you're going to lose some. So the point I'm trying to make is by the time you lose a bunch of rookies, you hire 30 and 20 go, you end up getting 10 to make round numbers. So one academy a year, it's hard to grow on. They actually, you might start with 28 and you end up with 23, 24, 20 retire. You're not really gaining any, anything. You can hold water with one academy a year if you have normal treatment. If you're going to grow, you're going to have to have two academies a year or you're never going to be able to pull off the growth. So the only growth you'll achieve <coughs> is on the paper side when these guys are in, in training and you're not deriving any benefit from them. By the time they're out, the nutrition's erased them. Are you still doing a strategic plan, you know, like we have a fiscal plan for six years, or is the department doing something like that where they're forecasting needs for service? And the reason I ask is that, you know, you were making you're, you're almost back on paper to 2010 number authorized. And we're now going into 2015 and certainly the population has grown and certainly your service demands have grown and there are certain issues there. So my question is strategically, can we, I'm asking it, maybe tasking, I'm just asking, can we get something that helps us forecast so we can better prepare a budget that meets growth? Because if we've always done it, we've always, if we keep doing what we've always done, we're just going to hold water, and I, I get a sense we're sliding, and we're going to talk about some things that are going on in the community. I know you're aware of them, too. So. Well, I would refer you back to the PERC report, <clears throat> because it gives you deployment for 374, where we were in 2010, and it gives you 5% uh, more uh, unobligated time in patrol, and then 5% more unobligated time in patrol above that. So um, we were at 26% unobligated time at 374. We wanted to be about 33% on obligated time. I, I think that was going to require another 20, 25 officers, say roughly 400. Um, and I, and then there was one for like 40% on obligated time that I don't think we're ever going to see. But um, it, the, the first report will show you with those three snapshots, those three sizes of a, of a department, how much unobligated time patrol will have if you configure detectives and everything else proportionally, and they give you the formula for that. And it shows you how many hours of the day, how many days of the week you have for every hour, 30% unobligated time. That's the goal, is to get an apartment to the size where they have 30% unobligated time. Now obviously the flip side of that is what your calls for service load because that's also going to eat in the unobligated time. Calls for service has been reasonably flat. Um, so with that 30%, that's where you start using <coughs> things like bear analytics to do uh, predictive policing. That's where you use problem-oriented policing projects, SARA projects, to do proactive policing. It's where you can start really doing community policing on a realistic level. If you're below 30%, you can do a little bit here, a little bit there, but the general the je benchmark is you're not going to really have meaningful community policing that really makes a difference in your town until you can get to that 30% unobligated time period. So where I would point you for a strategic, strategic direction is if this department was to grow in the future, just get the perf report out and say, okay, here's what they said in 2010 to get from 372 to whatever it was, 399 or 402 or whatever that number was. <clears throat> if nothing else changed with the calls for service load, 
we'd be there. Now, maybe something's changed, but I think you'd be fine-tuning at that point. If you got there, and then you started doing another study to see how much time you got in your hands, I think you'd find it would be pretty close to 33% on unallocated time. And we could start, and I'm not saying you wait till you hit that magic number before you even started doing that kind of work, but when we get back to 374, working people on the street will have 26, 27% unobligated time. You can do something with that and we will be back in that business. Right now, we're just chasing calls. So, and, and if we could just, I, I'm just gonna ask if, if perhaps looking at that, can you give us a projection of what it might look like budget-wise for costs if we were to do that? I'm, I'm just throwing a number out there right now off the top of my head and I'd like to get a little bit more exact if possible. So I think <coughs> Mr. Craig Jackson was alluding to earlier, well, what's an academy cost? I know there's a fully loaded, like, you know, another vehicle, computer, equipment, training costs, ammunition. I mean, there's certain things that you have to kind of look at. But on, on a, just a general basis, I'm thinking a brand new officer coming through, starting is about, about 100,000 a copy person. Well, for back of the envelope calculations, that's what the figure we use. Yeah. Um, and academies usually, and hard costs usually run about $300,000 or so to buy the bullets and belts and uniforms. That's not buying. 25 new cars, obviously. Right. That's In that scenario, you're giving the recruits the old beaters and just not cycling them out as fast as you normally would. But you still, if you grow your department, you still have to have that much more. If you're going to grow your department, then you're going to either need to buy more cars or resolve that your fleet can tolerate being run two or three extra years out there to defer that, that cost into the future. But obviously, eventually, you're going to need the cars, sure. whether you get them now or get them later. So if we can, if we can just get something like that to project, I'd like to have a number we can look at for planning purposes in the next year or so. It may not happen next year, but it, it, certainly we need to look at that because it looks like you're just going to keep up, and that's crossing our fingers and toes, and we don't have a catastrophic loss of either a bunch of people retiring or a bunch of recruits not making it. Well, my short-term goal is to get us back where we started, right. and then that my longer-term goal, if I'm here, um, would be to really take the fat perf report, dust it off, you know, maybe have them come in and adjust it for population and calls for service levels, and but the, the basic premises are sound, I believe, and uh, wouldn't take much to do an, an addendum to it that could tweak it for whatever the population and calls for service trends have been, and then try and implement it. We have implemented almost everything in the perf report, probably everything in the perf report that you can do without by adding the bodies there <clears throat> in terms of how we structured ourselves, the technology we purchased, the, uh, the, uh, the number of sergeants we promoted, um, establishing the, the CompStat model, which we call Aurora. You know, I mean, we've done all that stuff, um, but turning it into proactive policing, if you don't have the time, unobligated time, then you're not doing it. Um, anything we should know more about uh, what's going on? Exciting and new police department chief. There. Exciting and new <laughs> <laughs> that we didn't um, cover, I suppose. <laughs> well, I mean, there's all this stuff going on with police department cases and things like that happening. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in terms of the stuff that usually comes to assembly, it's generally it's budgets. And is APDEA's contract still under negotiation? Still under it is. So. Okay, well, I know there's rules behind all that, so we'll, uh, we'll move forward and we'll, I guess, see things as we get updated. The, uh, I guess I could put out, I mean, I'm really excited about the camera project. Um, the thing I think is holding, right now where we are on that is uh, we've got a, about 65 cars fitted out. The infrastructure, the storage is there, the network's there. Uh, we've got about a dozen of the cars, I think it's a dozen, I can't exact number, but right around in there, that it, we've thrown the switch on them, and so they are out, out recording and practicing, doing the backhaul at the end of the day, and we're getting our minds around how the network's handling the traffic and, and all that. Um, we're looking forward to finishing the installs and turning the system on completely. Right now, what's uh, the only, the thing that's probably holding us back more than anything else is we need to hire a 
body and we've got the position created, it just hasn't worked its way through the bureaucracy yet so we can post it. But um, we want to hire a body for the purpose of managing all the data that we're going to be collecting because you got, you're going to have just a ton of, of data coming in and if we want to keep the frame rates up and if we want to keep the, uh, the uh, resolution up, it's going to eat up a lot of bandwidth, it's going to eat up a lot of storage, there's going to be a lot of requests for the information, the DA is going to need the video. I don't think the media is going to go away and <laughs> just not ask for video. <laughs> Um, so we don't know what the public records request appetite is going to be, how much time we're going to have to spend redacting video, um, custom editing it. Um, we don't know the answer to those questions yet, but we can anticipate that it's going to take a body full, at least one body full time doing nothing but handling that traffic. And so we're a little reluctant to throw the switch on everything until we got that body. Um, but most, a lot of the equipment's in. Do well, those cameras also have uh, a mobile component that's attached to a uniform or is just fixed in the car? There is a camera on the dash looking forward. There's a camera in, inside looking back into the uh, passenger compartment where prisoners would sit. Um, the officers wear a microphone, so that can transmit a certain sh short distance around the car. I mean, it won't transmit a mile, but so if the car, you know, the officer makes his traffic stop, he's recording it or she's recording it and then he or she gets out, approaches the vehicle, and has a conversation you know, with the driver of the vehicle. That's all recorded right onto the video, so you don't have to come in later and try and overlay something from a, a digital recorder like that on top of the video and try and layer the radio traffic in and all that. So most of it is going right over there. And then phase two would be on-body video sometime in the future. Yeah. We normally would go through the committee reports and then I usually ask if there's anything that needs to be heard from the community. Okay. Um, is it, you're trying to follow up on that particular question? Yes, I would be in touch with you right now. Um, so, so you are doing a phase where you have body cameras? Or no, it's an audio. Audio. It's, it's a record. It's right now it's only picking up audio. Yeah, I know, you know, that's kind of a hot topic right now, body cameras. I was wondering if you guys were thinking about that at all. We've been thinking about it since this whole project started. And we, we put in an additive alternate in the, the RMP for on body. In other words, we posted it for an in-car video system, but the bidders were asked, if you've got an on body solution, add it in there as a, as a possible alternate. We'll evaluate whether we want to pick up the alternate or not. And so we narrowed it down to three finalists, but none of, and, and all three finalists had good in-car products. None of them had uh, on-body solution that was anything more really clunky. It didn't integrate well. Uh, for, for one reason or another, we just looked at it and go, well, we like your in-car solution, but the on-body solution just ain't, isn't there. And uh, so we, we didn't pick up on any of the on-body additive alternates. So we just chopped it into two phases. Phase one, we'll get that out of the way first. That's the in-car. Then we'll see how much money we got left over. It's probably going to be about a million. And I don't know uh, how much on body that will acquire, but technology's changed since the whole procurement started. And if we bid a separate uh, on body solution, you know, that's required to integrate into the system, see what <coughs> the other vendors are out there that might want to propose. I don't know if a million is going to do it or not, so we may end up doing it. After the dust settles on, on car, we'll evaluate that. And then we'll figure out if we, have, if we have to raise some more money or can we get started. How much is the on car total again? Uh, we've got two or three million into it already. Okay. I don't that, know the exact figure. Like years ago, about three million. We'll give you a chance to check with the yes. chief fairs. Some of it was state appropriations from the legislature and some was uh, grant. So stay within our committee reports. And then, no worries, we'll, we have a chance for audience participation at the end. Um, okay, so Chief, if that's it, we'll move on into fire. Merry Christmas to you, and if you would, please stick around on new businesses. I've got a good few things, and I've got a two-minute video clip I'd like to show. Fire Chiefs. Thank well, you, sir. You, want me to, you got a question? You want me to give Well, if you, we have two um, topics that we were concerned with, and I guess we'll start with the second one first. I, I'm not aware of how many uh, seasonal fires that we get normally, Christmas trees or dry weather or, you know, people being inside more, maybe... I don't know if you've seen any spikes that are on par or better or worse than that. 
Uh, I would say there's not like a surge or anything that occurs around the holidays, but that's a good lead in. We usually do a little safety at the beginning of our meetings, and uh, so it's a general reminder of the holiday uh, fire hazards. I believe that we uh, actually did a uh, press release yesterday with a demonstration. I haven't seen it, but I'm sure it was spectacular. So uh, this time of year, people that choose to use uh, live Christmas trees, you know, maybe don't water them, don't take care of them very well, and they do become a fire hazard. So across America, somewhere there will probably be a couple fire Christmas tree fires, and they can be uh, very devastating, uh, very fast moving fire. Uh, we did have one happen here in Anchorage a few years ago, uh, and there was a fatality as a result of it. So, so if you have a live Christmas tree, take care of it. Um, city manager joked yesterday, <coughs> if you don't have a live Christmas tree, don't water those ones. So a little bit of converse. Anyways, and then the other the other one is. Um, uh, more of a Thanksgiving, but some people do, do turkeys at Christmas. Uh, be very careful uh, if you choose to deep fry your turkey. My suggestion is just don't do it. But um, people and do do it. Indoor one now, you can plug it into electric and it's self enclosed. Really? Yes. Well, maybe that's a lot safer. Okay. But uh, I believe we had a retired uh, paramedic do this a couple years back and he burned his house down. So it does happen. We've had them happen here in Anchorage. And um, so be careful if you choose to barbecue your or deep fry your turkey. Anyways, so uh, the chief is absent today. He's at negotiations, our negotiations, so he asked me to fill in. So that's probably the biggest activity we have going on with the fire department right now. One of the now. questions we had, I, I'm still negotiating. Yep, yep, so that's uh, where he is today. So staffing and equipment, are, are there any plans for an academy? We, okay, so on uh, staffing, we have uh, an academy going on right now. We uh, have eight uh, firefighters in the academy, eight firefighter paramedics, they're all paramedics, and uh, they're scheduled to graduate Middle of January, I believe. Um, I'll probably be invitations going out for that here soon. Typically, you guys are all invited. So, um, and then we're scheduled to uh, send out conditional offers of employment to 14 to 18 firefighters uh, the first week of January. So we're still waiting to, to solidify the number of retirements and folks that are willing to commit to leaving next year. Um, so that's what's going on with our staffing right now and then equipment are you, good, are you pretty good yeah i know that there have been some over the past couple of years there have been some uh, bonds that we were able to get like an engine company a couple engine a couple paramedic and maybe a truck yeah in, in my opinion we're doing we're doing good on equipment uh, when you say equipment you mean apparatus, the apparatus. Say. and uh, we typically uh we spend or, or bond uh, about three million dollars a year to replace apparatus so typically we'll replace two or three ambulances, not typically, every year we replace two or three ambulances. And then um, we'll replace one or two, maybe three fire apparatus. So right now we have uh, engine nine, which is from Huffman Station, that's being built right now, and it's at its midpoint. And we're in the process of specking out a new ladder truck for downtown. And we're also gonna be buying uh, uh, several water tenders. And these are off municipal bonds, okay? Yep. Yep. The Engine 9 funds came from the state. That was a legislative grant from a couple of years ago. I don't think we can count on those going forward. No. Yeah, no. At least the immediate. So we have a good, uh, we, we do, I believe we do a good job replacing our, our apparatus overall. But we're going to do, speaking of strategic planning, we're going to try to do some here this uh, first part of next year and, uh, and just review what we want to replace in the future and make sure we it plan and budget so one, one of the other things that I should mention just to get out there is um, since I've been in this job one of the things that we've done I don't know if it's conscientious or just by accident but we have a really solid reserve fleet so there was a point probably when I first got promoted uh, you know 2010 we were at a point where we had one or two reserve ambulances so when something broke or was in the for repair we did not have anything <coughs> that we, we were very thin on uh, backup fleet. So uh, today we have five reserve ambulances, I believe five reserve engine companies. So there's a lot of depth there. So uh, uh, so we're able to not only schedule maintenance, but we're also able to uh, be prepared for the um, you know unplanned emergencies. You know when something breaks down. And uh, Murphy's Law, there's always something breaking. It seems like, but we're always just a little. It seems like anyways, we're just a, always just a little bit ahead of it. We have not run out of equipment, replacement equipment. So. Thank you.
Yeah. Um, if you would stick around just a minute, yeah. I guess I'll. Yeah, we, uh, the, other t the other thing that's kind of big that's happening are uh, Station 3 and Station 9. So we're, we're uh, finishing up the design on those two stations. So Airport Heights and uh, Huffman, the arm in Huffman. Uh, and uh, if all goes as planned, we should be breaking ground this spring on those two stations. And how, how long do they expect to be in the end of that process? One, one year, 12, 12 months or less, probably. Station 5 was, uh, it took us 10 months. The contractor was great, and uh, the project got done way ahead of schedule. So, knock on plastic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it all would goes, right, would right. These two stations go as well as that. So, okay. And if you could just, uh, just yep. a few minutes, we've got a couple of issues that might be applying as well. Yep. All right. Uh, Health and Human Services, sir. Thanks for being here, Melinda. Uh, thank you. And I, it's my first meeting, so I don't know what to expect, but I, uh, I don't know that there's anything. Um, unusual going on in the Department of Health uh, as far as the safety center and um, safety patrol gold belt as you're aware uh, took over that contract in October and things are running rather smooth there uh, the safety patrol staff did purchase some personal uh, cam uh, cameras for themselves um, I think they purchased five one for each band for when they're picking up uh, individuals in public uh, and they just purchased them so I don't know you know how well that's working yet, nor do I know that. I'm sure it's not as sophisticated as the system as the chief would be, be wanting, but they, they uh, have purchased those recently. Um, but it seems to be running smooth. Do those cameras, will they be in the passenger compartment or are they gonna show the contacts on the street as well? They'll be on the person's, on the safety patrol um, employee's body. And so when they're picking the individual, individual. Now Chief Mew has recommended uh, just just today that perhaps we look at getting some cameras for the vans themselves to look at the back portion of the van in case there's any incidents that occur there. We've had some instances in the past, I believe. Back so that's something we'll look at when we get back into the office. Can, can I add on something to sure. relate to all of us? Uh, it's a safety patrol um, tidbit. People are always ask me about how it's going with the dispatching and all that. So our dispatcher, Don Tallman and Mark Lassard and, and the Gold Belt folks, they're working really well together. One of the things that Don has told me recently was when we first started dispatching, we would have 20 calls in the queue waiting. It was just unbelievable. It was just calls for service, and it was just taking forever to get to them all. And with all the changes that occurred, the additional van service and uh, adjustment of some of the policies and turn on staffing levels and all this, uh, Don is saying that there's never more than five or six calls in the queue. Most times there's, there's none, you know, priority calls anyways. So, They've done a lot of massage and there's a lot of credit to the guys, to the folks that have been working on this. And, uh, Our drug transports are way down. Yeah, yeah I would agree with Mark. They're, they're way up for ASP, yeah. but they're way down for yeah. us. Yeah. And that's, but, but that's, that's what our goal was. But that's where the goal was, adding the additional. Yeah. Staff staff. yeah. We were all. So, and even, and even with the ASP, even though the calls are up, there's less that are waiting because we've managed the resources better and got, got the van service higher in the busier times and lower in the slower times. The contract on that is Gold Belt down at Juno? I'm, uh, yeah. That is correct. Okay. Uh, one of Gold Belt's subsidiaries, I think it's Gold Belt Security Inc. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. We were <clears throat> fire department building for medic transport. Is that still out of Palm? No, no. It's in California. Whitman. Yeah. So uh, that's what we can Well, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, and we'll be talking about the new business just a moment. On, uh, oh, yeah. Mr. Okay, yeah. Believe it or not, we're actually starting our initial uh, planning committee meeting for the Alaska Shield 2016. So that's going to be starting in February. Uh, that's the statewide exercise, of course. Uh, we're setting up training for uh, the end of January for uh, the EOC. We'll be doing it in sections. We'll be doing the planning department for or plans and intelligence first. And then in February, we'll be uh, looking at the community service section and uh, going over our new uh, EOP and uh, working with them. We do have a brand new person coming on. Uh, she starts Monday for our new PIO. And I give you her name if I could remember it, but I won't. So. There you go. Uh, but anyways, uh, so she'll be uh, doing our outreach and our uh, working with the CERT and all that stuff. So that'll be moving forward as soon as she comes on board. So. 
Is she an addition or is she replacing Michelle? Uh, she's replacing Michelle Torres, who uh, moved on to the state. We're taking one from the state. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They snagged ours, so we're going to snag theirs. So. What, uh, if I don't, you don't mind, uh, Nikki Stoko is. She retired, and we have a, uh, a Michelle uh, Whitney <coughs> is our present uh, person that's in charge of that. I know and Nikki stayed around just to help train her. Yeah, she did a. Uh, she stayed, helped, got her, got the new hire in, trained her, and then uh, she's fully retired now. All right, well, thank you because I know I've been actually there's a lot of people in the community that it's surprising to me that people actually are tuned in and like, mm -hmm. like the brown bag lunch and like the yeah. emergency watch program. They're looking forward to seeing the transition either to CERT or back to CERT and how they work with it. Yeah, we're, we definitely want to uh, proceed with CERT. You know, we're working with, of course, the fire and police department. Uh, on moving that forward. That's going to take a little while, but uh, and a and it, one of the questions that keeps coming up is everyone thinks that we're doing away with emergency watch neighborhoods, and that's not the case. So uh, if someone asks you if we're getting away with emergency watch, no, we're, we're still doing that. We're still doing the outreach for that, uh, but CERT will be just some an additional thing that we're going to put in place so that people want to get certified, want to become more part of emergency management. Well, I know at first when they were going with emergency watch, you know, Ms. Bibbs was there and they mm -hmm. coordinated with neighborhood watch to do a lot of the transition or right. overlap. And so maybe perhaps that's a good thing to yeah. perhaps speed if they, if they're standalone and they're not part of neighborhood watch, they, they <coughs> show up on that. We yeah. can still have a person on the cap team running neighborhood watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Natasha well. Yeah. And something else I just thought of that affects all three of all all four of our departments, I think. Um, we, and I'll credit Jen for this, but she got most of the department heads uh, excited about going to the next level of Nixle. Instead of using the free system, we're going to actually purchase Nixle, the citywide product, and each of the departments that are interested are contributing a, a prorated amount, like mm -hmm. Fire and I are picking up most of the cost, and when you get down to little guys like OEM, it's a little bit that they contribute kind of based on how much we think the usage is going to be and how big the, how much money they've got in their budgets. So, um, yeah, they get grant money. Yeah, we, you know, we, we only ask them for about $25.32. Yeah, that's so, <laughs> about it. Um, we're, we, we're in the process of ordering it right now. It'll be delivered in January. And uh, then all the departments will I'll hit them all up, send them all a little bill in the mail. And uh, so the utilities, uh, police, fire, parks and rec, Thank you guys. Um, uh, OEM, mm -hmm. library, they'll all have their spot out there and be able to communicate with their the public and, and put out their notices. And so you'll see us driving next one a lot harder and we'll have other features available to us internally as well as the ability to do the stuff from home and so forth. We'll I have to come down and work to do it. So I think we'll, you'll see some improvement there. If you need help with that 32 cents, Paul Bellady and I might okay. can chip that in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll pass the hat. So, yeah. All right, Ms. Pitch, anything else? No, that's it. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, we added in the new business here, uh, uh, Anchorage Safety Patrol Concerns, Welfare Holes uh, at Anchorage Correctional Complex and Brother Francis Concerns. I think they overlap, so I'm just going to throw it out here and, and see if you guys are getting the same concerns, if you're making the same observations. And I, I really, more than anything, I'm opening this, opening this up as an opportunity for, let's, let's start looking at what we've got to do. We've got to do something. Mr. Oliva, who owns Grub Steak Auction next to Brother Francis Shelter, has been repeatedly, he wasn't last night's meeting, which is kind of a, a rare anymore. He's been repeatedly coming in talking about how it seems that it's a, a open air spice problem, people defecating, urinating, camping out, things of that nature, in around the Brother Francis shelter. And notwithstanding that particular area, that's of course the last end of this particular sentence. Um, uh, Mr. Train and I, after last night's meeting, took a little field trip. We went down Carla, went down 4th and 3rd, and I've got a little two minute video I can show you. I'm not sure if it's gonna show up on the computer, is it? If you can get it to come over, maybe we can plug it on the Look it in over here and maybe we can do it. Uh, to preface this, uh, I've been noticing and been, been reported to me that the Anchorage Jail, who's a Title 47 facility, the Anchorage Jail has been repeatedly on the weekends, I'm not sure if they're doing it the other nights, um, 
They're refusing to take non-criminal committals. And when I say refusing, what they're saying is we're full. And what that's doing is it's taking, it's making the police officers become a bit creative when they've got a problem person who's maybe combative and intoxicated, they end up charging them with disorderly conduct to get a criminal charge, thereby the jail can't refuse them. But the, the cost burden transfers back more to the municipality because there's a cost per prisoner for housing. There's already a cost for non-criminal, but I believe that's about half, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right, Chief? Non-criminal? Well, I have to check. Okay, that would be something that I would ask that you check because I believe that's what's going on. The irony is, my own physical, personal experience, disclosure as a police officer at the uh, university, we had a person just fitting that bill at the Alaska Native Hospital who wanted to get him cleared so he could go back. We had to turn that light off over here over the edge. It was dark. Let's see if we get this light on. You picked every light but that one. Yeah, I know. Is there another switch or something? Is there another turn? I'm going to hit it sideways. All right. No, you can't. There we go. Yeah. I hate to hit that. I hate to hit it too. Sideways. Okay. There you go. We'll just look outside the office. We're technicians. This is, I believe, Carlock Street. No, that's, I'm sorry. This is by the Brother Francis Show. Mm -hmm. This is passing. So you meant to back it up, Christine. Oh, okay. This is Carlock Street. There's a tent, tarp tent, between fourth and third. There's a bench that somebody's put a tent around or a tarp. There's people standing there. There's a bunch of sleeping bags. Can't quite see them. Every one of those is a sleeping bag with a person in it. That's Carlock Street between third and fourth. And there's the uh, Beans Cafe. And as you make the turn, there's usually the people crowded right around the corner in the front of the brother for the beans. And there's a transit pole that people lean against, and there's a bench. People usually lay on that bench and sit out there. As you go up above Brother Francis Shelter, as the Red Ruff Stake auction is coming up, the bench, you see people walking back and forth. This is at 11 30, quarter of midnight last night. And I think that's the far west end of Brother Francis Shelter's property. Here's the Red Stake auction property. And you can see that fencing, and it's kind of the hill up above it. It's also an area where people camp and tent. We, we drove all back in that area down there in LMP. Uh, I didn't really see any activity per se. We saw one tent up on the hill uh, that was uh, next to the fence, so he's crafted and tied it to the fence. And as we drove by uh, Grub State, the irony wasn't lost on me that up on above that hill it's hard to see, but there's a there was a tent that was attached to the fence. <laughs> But if it drove by, what the driver did the left wasn't lost on me. He looked at the sign that says Illinois Auction going on right there. <laughs> We're invested down there, folks. We got municipal light property, the power power property. We've got a grant going into the Capital Social Services with uh, Brother Francis. <clears throat> we, we've got we've got problems. It's not going away. It seems to be growing. CAP team has been doing a fairly good job, from my assessment, and watching the one on cleaning up camps that they're notified of. But that's just the finger in the water pool that just shovels them somewhere else. And that somewhere else is, is we're seeing more and more of this showing up down in Francis in the streets. This particular case I was referring to, I contacted Adult Protective Services, a 58-year-old, not very old, uh, get a call to assist a gentleman with a walker that kept falling. Citizens kept picking him up. Uh, he was over near Providence, and AP was busy, so I went over to help out. We were asked to go help out. I picked the guy up. We think that he was uh, more of the um, Alaska Indian Native male. Took him to uh, Native Medical Center. They said, we don't have the name. We don't know him. I took him back to Providence. He had Parkinson's. Turns out he had advanced stage aggressive Parkinson's. And he couldn't communicate very well. And so I went back to Providence, and he kept trying to say arrested, arrested. That's what I, best I could make. Turns out that they've been dealing with him since 8 that morning, and three times they tried to send him away home, but he had no home. He was an assisted living person that had uh, apparently been outed, ousted or whatever, walked away, and they had enough contact with him. He was in Providence for several months, and at some point he was discharged. 
They tried to find him an assisted living home, and the assisted living home said, we'll take him, but he's got to be able, by fire code, to be able to get out. We don't have a sprinkler system. He's got to be able to get out within five minutes of the sprinkler <coughs> home. And he's going to walk, and it took him an hour to get him from the car down the driveway to a second floor apartment uh, room. And he said, this isn't going to work. He called Providence. Providence said, well, keep him tonight, and in the morning, send him back in a cab. Friday morning at 8 o'clock, he shows up. All day long, they deal with him in the emergency room. The emergency room says, it's not an emergency. You're not, your problem's not emergent. Go away. I drove this guy around for three hours. I took him, I, talk, I talked to two medics. I said, do you guys have a system where I can find out where he might have lived before? Can we find him a place where, where he was picked up? Your system doesn't, doesn't database by name. You have to have a run number or an address. I don't have an address, I'm looking for. I was able to get some intel and find out about a assisted living home that he had been at six months prior and through a language barrier problem at three in the morning on a Saturday. There's just not a lot of resources, folks. There just isn't. And it reminded me of when we were back in the early 80s when we used to drive drunks around and we had no place to put them. And we'd drive them to the airport, DV victims that were intoxicated because the shelters wouldn't take them, and plug the TVs, the little quarter TVs for pocket full of change and leave them out there until the airport police called us and said, hey, we got somebody loitering around they said the police brought it, it, We've got to do something. We've really got to do something here. This is not, and I'm not throwing it all off on you. I'm asking you to help us because I, I don't know the exact answer. We can't arrest ourselves out of the problem. We can pick them up in the medic rigs and we can pick them up in a gold belt ASP rig. But where do they go? Where do we take them? On that particular night, there were people laying on the floor right inside the lobby. They were going to keep this guy at Brother Francis in the quiet room if he could walk in. He couldn't walk in. He fell twice. I got to the point where I couldn't pick him up. I called medics. I said, you might take him to regional. Providence has dealt with him. They, want him. they don't want him there. As I'm driving back to campus, I see Medic Ford driving right back to Providence. With him. An hour and a half later, two more APD officers go to pick him up for trespass. He gets arrested. He gets out on the, on the 8th, he goes somewhere else, another place, probably another hospital, gets arrested for trespass. He's in Alaska Regional, last I checked, on, a, on an arrest. He's in custody at Alaska Regional, in a hospital. But they're turning him away. I'm not sure if you're seeing it, Chief, Fire Chief, ASP. But Title 47 facilities are pretty rare. They're getting full, they're burgeoning. We gotta figure out a way to deal with some of this. This is, this is not acceptable. I mean, obviously we're seeing it. And we had a homeless coordinator at one point, and I thought we were trying to make some great strides, and we tried to put that back in, if you remember, a couple years ago. But we've got to find something. We've got an ad hoc committee on homeless, and I, I believe you're on that committee, right? I know, yes, yes. Well, on alcohol and drug abuse. Okay. And I really, you know, we need to we need to work together on this. This is this is not going away, and it's getting worse. This is this was last night. I can tell you the same thing, of, and double that on Saturday when I dropped this young man off on the sixth of December. And so this was a, this was last night after the assembly. I was asking if you want to do a field trip. That's what I was doing. So there it is. I, I've talked to Adult Protective Services. They they have to, there are some parameters as well. We all know the state's budget is going to be concerning coming going forward. This is an Anchorage problem. The people are here. I don't know that they're all from Anchorage, but they're here. So I just kind of wanted to share that and throw this out to you that. Uh, maybe there's something that you guys are seeing or doing that, that I'm not, that I'm missing. But when they're being turned away at the jail for non prim and no one's, you know, rescue mission said this guy was on an out. You know, they had, they were that period. I know we had the churches for shelters for very cold weather as a, as a backup for churches. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm talking one guy, but we just saw 12, 15 people right there. At least these people could walk. Well, you know, honestly, uh, I understand why you're reaching out to these guys, but they need to be reaching out to us because they're max. They are, they're doing everything they can do. And this is something the community is going to have to step up. Uh, we've gone through this exercise time after time after time, and we end up in the same place. It's going to cost a huge amount of money to deal with this. That's the only thing that will fix it is we've got to build a facility or facilities to be able to handle this. Because even in residential care, I, I've got in my district, 
uh, you know, we try to get longhouse development in the community and great stuff immediately. No, not in our neighborhood. It's not going to happen. I actually succeeded over a period of stretching it out, killing that project. Uh, we had an opportunity possibly to pick up land in my district out at the airport. And uh, we had 350 people show up at the community council that said, no, you're not doing that in our neighborhood. We don't want those people. It would appear to me the logical place is down where that auction yard was, where Ron Oliva owns that property. He not only owns that property, he owns property on the other side of the street. He's got some of an acreage down there. But I think what eventually is going to have to happen is, you know, we're going to have to look at putting something for bonding. We're going to have to, number one, get the money to try to get an idea of what it costs to develop this type of project. And then we're going to have to look at maybe the city bonding for a part of it. But I think the state, I, and I understand there's dire financial stress right now, but this is a state problem too. The, the majority of these people are not from Anchorage outside of the fact that they're here now. This is the place they come. And people are just going to have to step up. We're going to have to come up with the money to either do bonding or the state or the state doing bonding and build a facility. That's the only answer. I mean, you guys can pick them up forever, but unless you've got a place to take them, and there's no place. Well, and that's nobody what wants to get a neighbor. I don't, I, I, I'm asking, throwing this out here, because I'm asking, are you seeing the same problems where people are being turned away? Or are you having to charge people? Are you being, you know, like, you're taking your medic took them took them to the hospital and then the hospital said we don't want them to go away or we'll arrest you and they call the police so five people from fire department helped me on that particular night two from apd uh eventually came and picked him up there were two of us from uapd you see what i'm getting at look at all the resources we're dealing with in one guy in one night can, What's can i say something that not as oem yeah. this is just private citizen talking you know you you guys, you, you always come back to the same thing. You always come up and say, all it's going to take is money. Well, that's fine. It's going to take money. Could you guys uh, look at uh, getting a coalition together with the native groups and the corporate sponsors and stuff like that instead of turning automatically and saying, hey, let's raise money by bonding and stuff like that? Well, I, I mean, do you guys yes, we have. come together with that? <coughs> because well, let's right. face it, a, a majority is the native uh, corporate uh, community, you know, well, they should be helping up, stepping up. In this up particular the case, the guy was Caucasian, so I just. Well, not in, in this case. Okay, now you have a guy with Parkinson's. You have a guy with uh, obviously uh, medical needs. Uh, what what's the end that we have with red nose in with the <laughs> rumored head? Wouldn't he get a priority there instead of say someone that's a knee Could you have someone with a medical condition have a more priority to move something? This like is where we're. This is why I'm throwing this out here. Can you find an app? Let's read that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, two comments I want to make. And the first one is there is, for the first time ever, and I've been around a long time, that the Assembly established an alcohol mm -hmm. drug abuse committee. And we have a pretty large mission statement. And part of it is, you know, the homeless. Have you ever been to one of our meetings? Oh. Okay, so you saw, you see what's happening right now. We yeah. have, we're having presentations from agencies all over the place. And that's the part one where, where we're starting. And um, Bill Evans is the chair of that committee, and he's doing a pretty good job. Um, but take a look at our mission statement because um, there's some value there and some things that we want to do. And, um, and we, of course, we're going to need assistance and some money too. But I understand where you're coming from. And one other comment I want to make to you: um, the prior Health and Human Services Director, when we were about to put some money in the budget for the homeless coordinator, she said, "Oh no, you don't have to do that because we're going to work it out at Health and Human Services." So have you worked it out? Um, yeah, I believe I believe we have. Um, I part of my job. I'm the division manager, one of the division managers there, um, and a big, a large portion of my responsibility is working on the homeless issues. I work with both the Anchorage and the Balance Estate um, Continuum Care, the local um, coalitions for on uh, on homelessness. You know, we do have some very limited money. Um, through um, home and CDBG, um, particularly CDBG and public service money that we can contribute to help um, um, help with this problem. But uh, that really is a large portion of my job is um, working with the homeless issues and trying to find ways. Uh, I might add, and I'm sure everybody in this room is aware of it, um, but the housing first concept in Carlock Manor, um, 
the university has completed the first stage of two stages of, uh, of their assessment of both Carlick Manor uh, here in town as well as another housing first um, facility up in Fairbanks owned by uh, Canada Chiefs Conference. Um, the first phase just talked about the reduction in the cost of health care for the individual um, as well as um, alcohol consumption. I think it um, talked, it discusses, identifies cost savings from the fire department as well as police department. So we haven't hit. The second phase is going to be looking at the cost of that individual pre-movement pre into Carlick Manor and post um, <coughs> living in there after two years and what the reductions have been on the, um, the health care side. But just looking at the fire department, police department, safety center, and the cost of that housing versus the cost of all of our services, the savings were significant. I mean, if we had a place to put some of these, for these people to live, we can work on the service side of it. But we just can't get them off the street. We don't have the sticks and bricks or money for the sticks and bricks. But I am dedicated, I am dedicated for my next five years, I mean, that's my goal um, um, before I retire is to do something to fix the homeless problem. So if I can follow up, Mr. Chairman, you so you're a um, division manager, did you say? That's uh, correct. Okay, in addition to being a division manager, you're also the homeless coordinator. No, I'm not the homeless. We don't have a homeless coordinator. Okay. We don't have the we don't have a homeless coordinator, and we don't have funding for uh, a homeless coordinator. Um, I'm taking on those activities as well as Melinda Freeman is working on them, and then I have a project manager that manages um, some of the federal programs, and she is working on that also. So we've got three of us collectively. Hopefully, you know, it's close to one, well, somewhere close to a full-time equivalent, but not quite. Are you ready for me yet? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. um, so there's some things I know and some things I don't know. Um, I don't know about the difference in cost between the non crims and the criminal crims, but I'll figure that out for you. And no one has reported to me that they can't get people in at the club. That doesn't mean it's not happening, but it hasn't trickled up to me, so I'll have to look into that. Um, as far as the the third and Carla crowd goes, that is a tough crowd, it's a new crowd, it's a bit different than the crowd that we've normally, the homeless crowd we've normally seen, and uh, we haven't gotten a solution to that problem. Um, you know that we've been working hard to take it down the camps, and I'm going to talk about the camps, meaning the camps other than third and Carla. Um, as you drive in that video past Ron Levis place, it looked like you turned south on uh, Ingra, if you looked up to the west from there, about the place where you said the MOA auction sign was. There used to be a massive camp back there, probably 30, 40 camp tents back in there. I believe that's largely gone, has been for a couple of years. I'm not saying they don't sneak back in there every now and then. But, you know, we got bogged down during the ACLU suit, and after that whole thing settled, we had a, a process in place. It's a long process. It's a bit cumbersome. We work it. Um, CAP is active, they post those camps, we do take them down, we do push those folks around, we do try and get them into alternative housing. Um, I'm starting to get lots of uh, complaints from uh, organizations that uh, want to serve some of these people that we're just driving. The ones that we don't get in the program, we're driving them so far into the woods that, that the other helping agencies are not able to, to find them and, and, and provide services. So not everybody that's addressing the homeless issue is happy with the pressure the police department is putting on the homeless camps. So I take it on both ends. You know, the, there's the Ron Levis of the world that have a real legitimate concern about this stuff. And then the more we do to address that, the more we get criticized by other folks who want access to these people, easy access to try and get them in. So it's a balancing act for us. I'm not saying that we're we haven't given up on the camps to to appease or please the these other agencies, we're doing it and angering them in some cases, I think, um, or frustrating them, maybe anger is the wrong term. Um, it's getting back to Third and Carla, oh, and then, okay, private property is easy. So when Ron has somebody in his property, he calls us, if we can get there in time to catch him, we'll do something with them. We don't have to give them a two week notice and all that to seize their stuff and get, get rid of them. Um, but Ron's got a problem, and he, everybody knows what his problem is. He's surrounded on all sides, it seems, by, by the official services and then the unofficial camps. 
<coughs> and then he got the third and Carla, Carla crowd. I became aware of them this summer. They moved in, they just set up right on the sidewalk, right along the edge of the street. Uh, they are mean, they are nasty, they uh, do not cooperate with anybody. My sense is they don't want to go to any of the shelters. Most of them are 86 to anyway from Beans and Brother Francis. Um, they want to party. And uh, we run them off the sidewalks because they can't be on the sidewalks. They, they come right back. Patrol deals with them as best they can. We arrest them whenever we can. We run them off whenever we can. But they are a tough crowd. Um, they don't seem to be a typical uh, homeless that we usually see that just wants to have their camp and, and be quiet and be off the radar and, and get by with that kind of camp lifestyle. They want to be there. They're in your face. And where did they migrate from? I don't know where they came from. I, I probably need to learn more about them. I know patrol, if you talk to guys like Reiner and, and people like that, the word Area 11 all the time, I mean, they know every one of those guys. Okay. Um, my guess is they've arrested all of them several times. And I don't know, I don't want to assume anything without digging into it, but maybe some of these DCs you're seeing may not be so much because of overcrowding in a sleep off shelter. It may just be that the patrol's tired of them and they're resting them every time they can, at least out of third car. Now that, th this was, uh, what I, I, mean, I don't want to I want to separate the two uh, at the moment. I, I don't know, I can't speak to the third car crowd. To, talking about in general, uh, the call comes in, you check with dispatch, but I don't think there's many nights, particularly on the weekends that go by, where they don't get a call from the jail saying, hey, we're full for non -crime. So anybody you bring to us has to have a But maybe, you may be absolutely right. Check, because it's, and I didn't realize this, but they were talking to supervisors in the night over there, they are saying, yeah, this is a real frequent thing. It is absolutely not. So, you know, I, I go in and say, hey, there's three rooms open over here. Yeah, well, we're full. Okay, well, I'm gonna go charge a guy to serve the conduct, and I guess you can't turn him away then, can you? They just shrug their shoulders. Charge a guy to serve the conduct, he's yelling on a gurney strapped down the screen. And I take him to the same room that they would have put him in if he was not. But now I put a criminal charge on them. <laughs> had to go back with it. I'm not that I'm too averse to paperwork, but do a ton of paperwork to do that with an extra cost, an extra burden on the and time for the agency, only to do the same thing. And then now they enter into the, the criminal court side and the burden's down the court box, the court's down on the criminal case. Whereas they could have stayed in there for 10, 12 hours, as you know, sobered up, sent him back. Maybe he repeated it, maybe he wouldn't. <coughs> it's happening more often, is what I'm hearing. So I, I would ask and to ask them, maybe you check. Yeah, I, I will check. Please check and see if they're doing the same thing at Brother Francis Shelter, the rescue mission. I'm not sure what kind of sway we have with rescue mission. They seem to be more church related, connected to a specific entity. But I know Catholic Social Services. We have money going into the Catholic Social Services side. Yeah, in Catholic Social Services, you you know you can't be intoxicated to to, right. to stay there. This guy was, but that's as well as a cold weather shelter. So a lot sure. of the folks has, as the chief has mentioned, have been 86 and asked to um, um, uh, to leave the premises. And then, ironically, as we all know, the reality is, is that, particularly in the colder weather, and it doesn't have to be freezing uh, 20 below, sometimes hypothermia deaths occur is 15, 20 degrees, this is easy, and we get those occasionally, and, you know, in spite of what we're, and so that's what I'm saying, I just want to make sure that we are all kind of aware and ask for your help, and you know, I appreciate what Mr. Hall's saying, I'm asking you to help you create a, a Frankly, we're the legislative side. We can ordain, we can come up with funding sources, we can try to come up with creative solutions and try to find the you know, collaborative efforts to do it with, with government, non-government, non-profit, uh, native association, federal, state, city. But it takes someone to execute. So tell us what you're seeing, give us some suggestions of what might help what's going on in the immediate now, and then down the road, the sticks and bricks and mortar, whatever, we may have to look at that and, and look at ways. No, I, I, I think we've got to look at it, look at it hard. I think a lethal location is probably the best location in the city to be able to do that type of a thing. Um, but it's, it's one of those things, honestly, Paul, we, we just got to stop discussing it. We, we, we got to do something. Yeah. I, I, I mean, we're seeing it. I mean, this is just oh, it, one it, little yeah, snapshot. It's getting, getting worse. So, anyway, I appreciate that. Mr. Jackson, anything? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And, and it's I'm a tough good. nut. I, yeah, I always buy that. Third and Carlock in the middle of the night uh, last month. And it's nasty there. 
Yeah. And I've been by it a few times in the summer, and uh, I know it is frustrating control. No yes. Staff at Brother Francis Shelter are very concerned. They're concerned for their own safety, now. Because they, some of them have to catch the bus. They try to go to the same bus stop with these people, right? They're really concerned about it. Okay, uh, we're open to uh, audience participation. I know that I, uh, I see a couple of persons here on uh, uh, reference the uh, tri grill and ultra LED uh, lounge. Uh, before we get into that, I know you may have a presentation. Is there anybody else that's here that would like to address? I know. Gosh, where do I start? Yeah. Um, <laughs> He has. He's trying to do that. Is he still trying to do that? I, I think so, but again, that's more of the executive side. We can't negotiate with a property on our own. So we can certainly entertain conversations with him. Yeah. Uh, the mayor's office has had some conversations with him. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, I met with um, Mr. Traney and H. Curtis Lambay mm -hmm. and Jim Trent from MLP mm -hmm. to talk about the possibility of one of those agencies buying that property. Oh yeah, this was about, I don't know, a couple months ago. And of course, you know, it was up to um, the mayor to go forward, and if it didn't happen, it would have to come to the assembly for approval, but um, Mr. Tramp wasn't interested because he didn't feel like MLP had any use for it, and um, HLP didn't have any interest either. Mm -hmm. So that was the extent of my particular way. And I'm not sure that the, we, we did actually have Mr. Uh, the MLP come by in here a couple months back, something like that. And uh, my understanding is, is that they would, there at that time the discussion was just to purchase the property to alleviate, alleviate Mr. Levis' immediate concerns, but there were no plans for the sticks and bricks or going forward as a tenant here or any other. It was just seriously to get him out of the picture so that he didn't feel that his property was deteriorating in value. I don't know, but I, if we think about the property and if they put another facility in there to deal with this population, I think Fairview Community Council would go nuts. I, I kind of feel the same way. I think this collaborative effort. I, don't, I mean, that's not my thing. No, um, but I, my, I, my sense is that it would become quite mobile. Another thing, um, you mentioned uh, you know somebody being arrested for disorderly conduct. Were you speaking? Yeah, he, arrest, or was well, it? the officer was me from the oh, other half. Okay, that's what I understand. It was you from, okay. from the university side, but it's when I talked with APD who were there under some similar circumstances, they were saying, Oh yeah, this happens all the time. And oh. they just they get there and if they told non criminal school, they go across the road, across the hall, and pick up the phone and call the magistrate and charge them with resisting or disorderly conduct or something. And and that's just burdening down the courts and it costs the municipality double from, I, and I don't quote me because he's going to check the figures, but yeah, yeah. I believe if you non-criminally commit someone for about a 10 or 12 hour block, it's about half the rate of an in custody arrest that's processed through the courts. And this is a, this is unwillingness on the part of the... It, it's, this is why I'm, I'm asking. I'm, I'm throwing this out because I don't know. I, I you know, I didn't, all I was told is it was full, you got no other recourse. And I said, yeah, I do. And I'm going to cross the hall and charge again. Well, these uh, these are these are things the things that frustrate me all the time. But I will check into it, and if it's if that's the case, I'll go see the commissioner, and we'll see what we can do about freeing up space in the jails. I don't know what that means. That might mean moving people out to Palmer for the weekends. We used to do that all the time during the '90s. But um, you know, I'll, I'll look at it. That may free up some space for criminal jail for people that you know. I, I guess that's what I'm saying. It's just ironic because the guy went in the same room that they normally hold on for. And this was like December fourth, you said. What's the date? Again? I can't tell you that one. I don't know. It was, it was in the last two, three weeks. Oh, okay. Very December sixth was when the other general department. That's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, we were having a problem with the pretrial detainees in the halfway houses escaping the night before trial, and it was vexing our people. We did some research. We went to talk to the commissioner. He fixed it that day. Um, now with new government, new commissioner. You know, it's maybe time for me to go make another house call, but um, first I need to check into this and find out, you know, to the extent that how often it happens and so forth. And I can do my best to fix that. That would be, it's a band-aid, but. Um, yeah, well, you know, like I said, we've got we to gotta deal with the media here now, and then we certainly need to deal with the plans for going forward, so. Okay, uh, anybody else? Sir? 
John, anything? No. Ma'am? No. Al, anything? Uh, I do want to pass to the colleagues. Uh, Al has passed out a, uh, some commentary on Uber. And Al, if you wanted to share what you had with your conversation with your insurance company. Yeah, I called, I have Allstate, <clears throat> called my agent, and I said, well, hypothetical, obviously, that if I drive people around like Uber, so he checked with the regional, and they said not no, but hell no. They said no insurance company is going to uh, pay for anything that may happen because if you're transporting goods or people, you become commercial. And that was all saying. He says he's sure the other insurance companies would be the same way. So that would make Uber keep on saying they have a million dollar policy. Well. That means that if I drove somebody around, my insurance company would not be the primary. It would, and everybody's trying to say that there's an umbrella. Well, it's not an umbrella. That, there it becomes primary then. So, for what it's worth, I didn't check on it to my, my needs. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, Mr. Alexander, I know you had a, maybe a brief presentation on this. Brief. I'll put these up here. This is a. <coughs> This is just kind of a, in a nutshell, my plan. Oh, yeah. You, uh, if you guys want to leave, you certainly can, but otherwise, uh, fire, health, uh, this, this, it, this is an I'm only, yeah. Okay. This is just a, uh, in a nutshell, my business plan in the formal Jack's building. And so I come to I have seat here. Yes, so I come here and I brought Tony Anderson with me. Tony is the owner of NSA Security Company, who uh, does security for us when we need. And just identify where we're recording, so just identify yourself, sir. I'm Robert Alexander, okay. the owner of LED and Tribal Restaurant downtown. And with me is Tony Anderson. But basically, you know, I, I come before you to, um, <clears throat> you know, based on these, these, these plans here, in a nutshell, is if, if there's anything that I can do to make things better um, on everybody's behalf, I know that we have someone else here, I guess, who wants to also talk to you guys regarding what we're doing, or I should say, I guess, what we're doing. So I try to introduce myself to her to see if I could help in any way uh, or any problems that she might have that you know I can work with. So we'll see how that works out in the future. But um, I just wanted to present again what I have and wanted to know if there's anything, any concern that you guys might have for me or what I can do to make uh, my operation better. Again, better for everybody. So, <coughs> I, I, I had a chance to talk to Mr. Alexander since the uh, meeting before last. In his application, if you recall, uh, there's a uh, conditional protest on the transfer uh, to from Trina, the owner of the liquor license. Currently, it was transferred back, if you remember, we approved it from uh, Platinum Jacks owners to Trina, all of Mexico, for permit license. And now we're in the section where it transfers to Mr. Alexander for him to perform uh, business as Tri Grill uh, and Ultra LED Lamp. So, or LED Ultra Lamp, sorry. Um, the physical location is the old Long Next building that has been in existence for better than 40 years, if I recall. And at times they had better than 50% alcohol sales in Long Next, talking to Trina. And I'm not sure, Mr. Alexander, this is one of the concerns I had. We don't, I haven't seen yet any of the conditions that Mr. Flynn has posted. Have you heard from him? I have not heard anything from him. So it, Flynn, these were some of the typical requests. What's going to happen, sir, is that there's a, apparently a scheduled meeting, and Mr. Flynn is helping to align the schedule. We had a change of leadership last night. And I believe Mr. Crane uh, will be responsible for working with the clerk to get a meeting where uh, any conditions or concerns that have been presented to you, you'll get a chance to present uh, responses to those concerns to meet whatever uh, protests that we have. Okay. Uh, one of two things will happen. We'll continue the protest or we'll lift the protest. Do you know the date for that meeting yet? 
Uh, I don't. I, I think I he's got to set for January. 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 The 27th. Yes, what would you say today was the first 27th. one? 27th. Yeah, that, that's that's going to change because I'll be out of the country at that time. I won't get back until February sometime. So Was there one earlier than that, too? Did I hear two dates? Well, well we, we have January 13th, and then the next meeting is after the 27th because we only have every week. So I'm trying to figure out my deadline to get you guys the, the data, and I thought oh, yeah, I'd tell right. you where I was on that, and that you might be interested, Mr. Alexander might be sure. interested in that as well. Uh, so ultimately, Mr. Alexander, uh, the the biggest concerns that we've heard from community, really downtown but citywide, is uh, what it, what appears to be a pattern of overserving of alcohol, uh, going beyond uh, like serving up to the last minute before closing the doors or when the, when the uh, time to close sales of alcohol by state law. Uh, and, well, I'm sorry, by municipal. Uh, restrictions on what we're allowed to do. And, uh, and then just the problems that have been cropping up, not necessarily at just that location, because we have had some, but there's been some downtown as well. In fact, I'm not sure this past weekend, but it, it was, seemed to be a bit calmer, but um, we were looking for some assurances that your uh, business is going to be more than just a party house all night long kind of thing. And, and I, I did make Full disclosure, I did make contact at, at the location, and the far east end of that building is designated restaurant only, right? I mean, that's just restaurant right? I wouldn't say only. It, it is it's, it's set for uh, six days a week will be lunch and dinner uh, with the closing time of, of approximately 11 o'clock. However, on the weekends, you know, we do cater to the Latin community for Latin dancing on that particular side. And so that side? On, on that side, that's correct. Now, you know, on the other side, the west side of the building, is, which is LED, it's more of a lounge. It's also, <clears throat> it's a pretty large menu that we have there, but on the LED side, it'll be two-thirds of that menu, and we'll cater from 4 till about 1.30, maybe 1.30 to 2 a.m. with folks that want to come out and have dinner, play dinner, or whatever it may be, listen to some music, you know. But, of course, on the, um, on the, Maybe Saturday, maybe Friday and Saturday. Certainly, more people come out. You know, we will cater to it. You know, we, we're in business to to do the best that we can, and, and getting people into our organization or, or our business. But uh, we will have security, as I kind of spelled out a little bit what I have here, uh, what I kind of lined up. Right, you know, as far as the security cameras, you know, the equipment that we have to track people if we have problems. They, you know systems that track, you know, you actually scan the ID cards or driver license and you have all the information for anybody that actually enters the building after a certain hour, we'll do that. Um, along with that is I brought Tony here and I don't know if you have any questions, you can certainly ask me because I think we're both on the same page as far as security and the measurements that we're taking to, to minimize any issues that have been going on downtown and or around town. So. Absent vacation time, sir, like you're saying, you're going to have a country. Absent that kind of time period, how often do you plan on being physically at that building for right, your own physical time? I'd be there quite a bit. You know, I mean, certainly it's a new business. Uh, partially, um, I have a, the same type of restaurant on the south side of town. It actually runs itself. So, so I have plenty of time to spend at this new location so that it runs and can stay open. So I have to spend, I, I suspect, uh, at least a year that I'd probably be there, probably a good portion of the time, especially in the later hours. If they do decide to open, you know, well, they would decide to continue to do that on the, on the, on the weekends. I can, I can assure you, your concerns are my concerns as well. You know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a liability, and I understand that. But, uh, Chief, and I, do you have some information you were able to share today, or did you? Uh, I there's something I want to say, and then okay. I was going to tell you my methodology and what I, what, what kind of data I'll have and who I'll make available to. Um, you recall at assembly last assembly meeting two weeks ago tonight last night, um, you asked me to run some calls for service, and we picked August, and so I looked at August forward. That was like four months, and then four months back, 
and there's a great difference in the data. Well, I got thinking about why that might be, and I thought, you know, that restaurant might have been closed for a portion of the first four months. So I went back, found that reporter's articles um, in <laughs> covering the, the, the closing of Platinum Jacks, and I was able to put a, a closed in on Platinum Jacks, and I realized that we were probably comparing uh, four months of intermittent use um, by uh, um, the new owner against a four month period of time where it was vacant three most of that time. So that, that was a, no wonder there's no calls before and there's a bunch of calls after. So that was a, a hasty thing done on the fly and I don't think we can learn very much from it. So I know the assembly asked for information and I think it's due any time now. I worked with a, with a, sat down and thought about it for a while and the methodology I came up with is this. I took, I took the before and after shot at about mid-July and I think based on the articles I read, I didn't know who to call to find out the exact day that, that you might have started in there, but I think if I take that Jan July 15th and go six months after that date and six months before that date, I'll get an equal length of time both of which have about six weeks of nobody, or about three weeks of nobody occupying the building, and the rest of the time somebody occupying it. Now the difference is, I think you're you're doing intermittent uh, business there against the previous owner who was there every night, so it's still not going to be perfect. Then I took calendar year 2013 for a bunch of bars downtown, just to see what a year's worth of bar activity might look like, and I picked some that are restaurants and some that are bars and some that are high volume, high call load, and some that are more upscale, lower volume. So you can get, you can pick and choose and, and see, you know, what the different bars would look like. And then I thought we would look at, um, uh, someone asked that I look at fusions, just to compare your other building to business. Of course, that's gonna be a smaller business located not downtown, so that it's not gonna be perfect apples to apples. None of this is gonna be perfect. But what I'm gonna try and do is provide data that give everybody ability to compare uh, different businesses, different locations, and see if there's, if you can make, and I don't know what that data is going to say. Uh, it will not necessarily all be straight up calls for service. Uh, I think the, I told the crime analyst to go to work and try and call out stuff that wouldn't be pertinent to a bar um, or a restaurant. And also to research every one of those calls and make sure we're not attributing uh, stuff to it because it's a landmark, you know. Chill Coots gets that, you know, I'll be 1070 in front of Coots on Bravo Delta 5, you know, whatever. Um, and it's just a landmark, and so it has nothing to do with Coots, but it gets tagged against that address. So we're going through all that right now. And while I don't think we'll have perfect data, I don't think we'll have perfect apples to apples, we should have something that is as scrubbed as we can make it, and it'll be what it'll be. Uh, some of it will be in a mapping version, so you can see change data. Um, over time, some of it will probably be tables just to give you breakdowns and numbers. Um, I've talked to Mr. Anderson, he's interested in the data. I think it's only fair to provide it to everybody and it be a public record, so when it's done, I'll get it to the assembly, I'll get it to you guys, and uh, we'll see what's in. Can I add something to that? When you, when you do fusions, because it's the fusions and the travel lodge, it's kind of tied into the same building. So, what, so what you're services. saying is Travel Lodge might generate call to service that you get dinged with? By far. Okay. So you might keep that in mind when you're coming in there, uh, when you're doing your, your data. That, that so you manage only different. the fusions part? Right. Have nothing to do with the rest the the, uh, the hotel at all. And you just manage the fusions? You don't, you don't own it? That is correct. Uh, well, no, incorrect. I, it, it, it's kind of getting back into again, what their original problem was with the ABC board. So they had some issues 10 years prior to me getting there. So when actually I got there, I uh, jumped on board as management to try to fix these problems with the ABC board. So at that point in time, I jumped, jumped on board as, um, as the management, you know, for park management for the entire, for the fusions. My main claim to Fusion mainly was to bring in, because I'm in the restaurant business, is to bring in the Southern food in that location. 
but it also ties into the bar is a very small place, and so I kind of oversee, um, along with someone else, uh, Sharon Cho, who is and always have been the um, uh, the had management agreement for the from the uh, the licensee. So again, I just kind of jumped in the middle of that. The sure, it's a straight statement. You don't own it. That's correct. Okay. I, I do. I mean, if you look at the business license, you know. It's Fusions real show me is one of the owners on the restaurant part of the side, but it's, so it's two sides in nice. this business. You got the you have the licensee, and then you got the restaurant. Got it. Okay. But I do not own the. the I had no interest in the in the licensee from the license. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Isn't that license the old Hal Hal restaurant liquor license? I don't. It, it's very possible. I can tell you from what I. have Think is the Hong and Lee owns that license, <coughs> and it you comes. Said Susan, right? <coughs> no, Sharon Cho Sharon. is is uh, <coughs> the Cho's family owns that building, and with that building comes a liquor license. Okay. And so, kind of what the problem was in the beginning was they were leasing the license for the last ten years, and so unfortunately, when I came into the picture, you know, um, it. it came up to be there's this issue because you can't lease a liquor license. And so I I kind of got that whole thing straightened out with the ABC board, got that management agreement with them. But it's still with Sharon Cho that was the, the uh, licensee, or the licensee used her for the uh, operations for the uh, liquor license. Well, and again, we'll have to get the concerns that are, that are listed, if you will, for, through uh, I know Mr. Flynn is in his district has heard from a lot of constituents, so he was helping to craft, I, I believe, the concerns that he was talking about for conditions that that, mm -hmm. uh, that are going to be proposed. I haven't seen those yet either. Um, so based on what I'm seeing, I'm looking at the security component, and I'm really, I'm really, um, I mean, it, to me, it seems like a plus. Uh, 40 cameras, 15 security personnel for weekends, uh, depending on the amount of people, and then the scanner. And then people going in, not just in, but outside as well. And the only thing that might beg, and Chief Mike can help me on this one, but if they've got an increased amount of security and they're noticing problems, they'll actually be calling sometimes, I imagine, for police assistance. Does that ding against them when they call, or is that something that Oh, that's always tough because, you know, we don't want to uh, work, hold it against somebody if they're being real thorough and keeping their, their organization clean. So we just got to look at those and sit down with the owners and go through the data and, and make so on that table, if we could find out if there were any calls where they actually made to say, hey, you know, rather than somebody, some neighbor or driver by sees the problem and calls it. Yeah, and so it's a lot, you can see it's a lot of work to try and sort it out so you get the data where you actually understand the context of it rather than jump into conclusions. I, I can tell you that we try to uh, handle any, anything prior to calling you guys. I mean, we we do have trained security, you know, um, but we will we will try to maintain. If we had to call someone, in, and it has happened, where uh, we had to at that point in time, I think by law you have to call the you have to call the police department. So but we try to handle uh, anything like that uh, within our. I would urge any business the same thing. If you got someone that's committing a crime. You know, call the police. I mean, if you've got someone in there with a weapon or they're belligerent, assaulting people, mm -hmm. um, oh, yes. yeah. if someone's just being mouthy, that's different. That they're of physically hurting someone, I can say. Do you, do you agree with you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if they don't know about it, then there's nothing to be done. And it actually spills outside, and somebody gets into a fight, a big brawl, they can say, well, they were just inside and they got shoved outside. And it makes you look like you were putting the problem back to the community, and that's what we've been having the problem with. You know, <clears throat> this is one of the things that did come up at the meeting, at the assembly meeting, is, well, I've only heard some of the issues that uh, some of the tenants, uh, the local residents had. She kind of mentioned it to me here today. You know, is there bottles uh, that that are out there uh, that they have to clean up or maybe on a Monday because of the weekend? And, but what, one of the things we mentioned is there, there's a package store right behind our building. You know, and <clears throat> and you know we we it's right. So you got our What's building. The name of that one? It's brown it's jug. A brown jug on, it's across from the casting. So it's on the other side. You know, but we too. They it's right behind, right behind our building. Um, 
almost. So we got that big office building, I don't know, it's maybe 12 or 13 feet, and right next to that building there, right next to Voyager on the, it would be on the east side of Voyager, the Voyager Hotel. Okay. So, but we, we took get bottles and stuff that we had to, you know, uh, clean up. And, and, and I would think it's not from our patrons. And I'm not gonna say that our patrons don't do these things, you know, they probably do, but, you know, one of the things that we, 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 we tried to do and have been is, you know, security while they're, they're going around the buildings throughout the night is in, at the end of the night, because at the end of the night, we try to clear that area. So we're not just trying to clear the people getting out of the building. We actually go out in the adjacent buildings um, on, let's see, from I-6, yeah, six, you know, we. You know, we try to clear it and get people out of it. We don't want them hanging around because that's probably where problems are going to start. You know, we, we try to clear that area, and I think uh, Anderson does a pretty good job getting that done. Um, it, it, I, I would say within 15 minutes, you know, pretty much it's quiet and most, most people are gone. To include, I'm out there myself. Of course, he warns that I should stay inside, but I'm out there, too, making sure that everything goes well. So do you commit to someone to pick it up and clean it up, even though it may not be yours? Yes. Yeah, again, the, the security company does that. No, I'm talking about like the bottles and the debris and stuff. Yeah, but that's what exactly what I'm talking They'll about. We'll, yeah, we'll do it too at the end of the night. So once everybody's gone, and we, we, we try to do this from day one. So, so realistically, the neighbors might be concerned about loud noise, particularly if there's a live band. They also would probably be concerned about late hours because the liquor store closes at noon or midnight, mm -hmm. and you guys would close. I'm assuming, like any other bar, mm -hmm. two or three, depending on the day of the week. That's correct. Do you intend to participate in the safety hour? I'm sorry? The safety hour, where you can stay open an hour and not serve? We are. We will, we will participate in that. So people catch cabs or maybe sober up if they've had close to I, I think it's a good thing. I, you know, the way I see that is you go further down 4th Avenue, you know, you've got all these bars and they hold however many people they hold and at the same time everybody's hit the streets so I ain't got a thousand people out there you know but we're kind of further on the uh, west side of that downtown area where um, we don't have that that much of that problem but yes we will participate in that just for the safety of the, of the participants ma'am did you have to add or suggest or well, yes, I'm a homeowner. Uh, What's your name? Sue Wrighton. Sue Wrighton? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so far I've seen no evidence of security really being outside. There's a parking lot that their customers park in that doesn't, uh, isn't secure. People are out there drinking. This isn't from the homeless. It's they're out drinking between midnight and 3 a.m. The noise is bad. There's already been big fights. Some of the police calls were about guns. I haven't called the police. But um, it's much the same again. I saw a drug deal right outside my window. And, you know, there's no security out there. It's pitch black out there. The bar doesn't own any parking for their customers. And so you can't put a lot of the restrictions on them. I mean, it was the same problem with Platinum Jacks. It was eight years and no one could do anything. And I mean, I, I've called the police, usually when it's a girl in danger, being chased or out here screaming. And, um, you know, drug dealers all have the police scanner. The bar owners had the police scanner. So even if I called, by the time the police got there, you know, everybody would take off. And it kind of looked like I was being a, nu a nuisance caller can't sleep in my home. I'm not safe in my home. When Platinum Jacks was there, I was threatened, I was chased. They tried to break in. You know, they came to my business and threatened me there. Um, you know, my health was shot. I can't sleep, you know, you can't, <laughs> I can't function. You know, I'm 57 years old. You know, it's, I need to be able to sleep at night. And my worry with this being a bar and a restaurant can they be open after hours? Like, it's three o'clock, oh, poof, we're a restaurant now. You know, it. I, 
I don't I don't believe they intend that. Do, do you or are you wear the safety hour? No. The safety, the safety hour allows. No, I, I understand the safety hour. I'm saying that because they have a separate restaurant sure. license. I don't think they're, they didn't apply for all the dogs. No, we didn't. Like, like because Platinum Village. Jacks did stay open Correct. after three. Den Den Denny's and Village Inn, of course, they've like, they got a business model with air conditioning use that they're open 24 hour diner type thing. Yeah. And I don't think. I'm not interested in, in staying open and doing a breakfast type thing at all. And you know, I can't say in the future you know, that we would cater to an event to that, but uh, I, I have no intentions of staying open past the uh, hours that I mentioned earlier. But it's also stated. But I, I am, I got, I... Because, I mean, Platinum Jacks did it. I would, I would echo her concerns about it. If, if, if you're saying you've got security, not, you're saying security, if you are conditionally offered to, to make the purchase and operate under the conditions that you're presenting, you're not saying you're doing that now? Or you no, we're not. You're, you're talking about opening... No, the security thing that you've spelled out in your business. We're doing that currently, right now. She's saying she's not saying... That's okay. If I'm ready, I'm, just, I'm sorry. Chair. Some of her concerns were addressed because when you have a club, you have people that come in with loud music. She has a very good concern. There's two of us that are armed and rotate that building outside. The rest of the people are inside. Uh, so our job was to make sure they keep their music down. So when we get to keep the, the, the uh, personnel outside the club at the end of the night, she does hear me tell them, let's go, you got the wrong. So it is my loud voice. But she does have a good concern because they will come down the street bumping their music. They won't be screaming or talking. That's when you have people leaving the club. That's going to be part of that business. <clears throat> Our job is to get them out there as soon as, as soon as possible, off the street, in their vehicle, at home, in a matter of 15, 20 minutes, which is what we do. So I have a question. Do you know that parking lot, is it, is it just like open to anybody to park after hours? I'll oh. tell you that, too. You have, you have one, two, <clears throat> three, four adjacent parking lots in that area. You have one across the street, up, which is I Street, right adjacent from the east part of the uh, building. You have one, two parking lots across the area, one behind our building and one on the, on the far left of the street. And then you have one in front down, which is right, right off the adjacent street towards the building. So our concern is that we, all of us, all 12 of us, when we get everyone out, goes outside, two people stay in the building, and we clear everyone. So my question is, is that are you guys authorized to use that parking lot? To use They're paid parking, parking lots. It's paid parking. Yeah, it's paid parking. They're paid parking. They have diamond lots, aren't they? Big park. Are they diamond lots? They're, They're diamond, diamond lots. Yes. Unfortunately, her property sits on that one, one of those lots. You're building right behind. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Small. It sits on one of the, park, the diamond parking lots <laughs> lot. But so I think the parking that she's concerned about, which she's, and I'm not sure if this is where you're going with this, is the illegal parking. Uh, the building right next to us is uh, is an office building, and behind there they have maybe six parking spaces, uh, but they also lead to right at the end of the parking, uh, that lot is where her building also sits. And so she, we sometimes park in that area. You know, we had a conversation outside here just a little bit ago. Uh, I've gotten permission, you know, for us to park there after hours, but she's, you know, sits the difference in there was a letter in there from the owner saying if they don't want to spark in there, I haven't seen that. Uh, so, but I think that's what she's talking about, not necessarily the diamond park line. No, I'm talking about the diamond You are talking about the diamond Because yes. it is, it, again, because they don't own the parking lot, apparently you can't put restrictions on the parking lot. It well, is, it's, well, it's pitch black out there. There has been no security. It's loud, of course. Um, you know. I think that, that, that may be the interesting. That may be the, the, the solution to some of it is that suggesting perhaps a meeting with this owner and the owner of the diamond lot to discuss options there. Mm -hmm. I think that may be something that could help alleviate some concerns. I'm just suggesting. And also, uh, our other concern is she can have my telephone because I'm there every weekend, directing whatever issues she and I'll come back to because I am there. Yeah. Yeah. But the issue is, is that she'd like to be able to get sleep on. Right. I understand. So she wouldn't have to call you. <laughs> yeah, I no. see. And I see. It, like I said, it's 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 horrendous, and you know, you shouldn't have to live like this. And now I have a house I can't sell because no one else could live there. You know, obviously I'd like to get out of there, but that's not going to happen either. Sure. And just to be a, a, I mean, every property on the block has said no to this. Catholic Church, the Captain Cook, the lot that is the Diamond Lot. One is owned by Native Corporation, the other is owned by Union. Um, 
managed by diamonds. But they're in clear view of the Captain Cook. And the noise gets so bad in there, you can see the lights coming on at the Captain Cook Hotel. You know, you have, it's right where the, the shuttle buses leave to take in the air crews out, to take the tourists in and out. And it's, it's, it's a nightmare out there. It just is. And I mean, they've been on good behavior since the meeting, but before that, it was since August. And it parties on the weekend. They don't come out of the bar till three. It's, you know, it's loud. And there's alcohol bottles everywhere out there. Nobody's been cleaning it up except the people on Sunday morning. And, you know, I, I don't care about the garbage as much, but people are out there drinking. You know, I don't know why a bar owner wants people outside drinking, but that's where it's been. And I, I do have concerns about the daytime chronic inebriates just because I did have a shop on 4th Avenue, and that's a, a bad situation as well. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anything else? Appreciate you being here. Uh, anybody have any other public comments? Ma'am, did you have anything else? I just have some questions I can ask. Oh, okay. Are you with me? Yes. Okay, I thought so. I was. Okay, uh, the uh, time now is uh, 1.42. We'll be going off record.